Hi, welcome to Virtual Playhouse. On behalf of the Bedford Playhouse, my name is Dan. I'm the Director of Development and Programming, and I want to thank you for tuning in for what is going to be a great conversation uh, between two people we're very appreciative towards for their time today. Uh, just want to remind you to please check out our website, bedfordplayhouse.org, for a lot of uh, great programming that's coming up and hopefully some news about reopening that will be coming up in April or May. Uh, we're looking forward to that and welcoming everyone back uh, as circumstances permit. Uh, so we're going to have a talk today about a great film uh, about Laura Ingalls Wilder. And to kick it off, I'm going to introduce you to our moderator, Nancy Steiner, who will then introduce our special guest. And they're going to talk a little bit about the film. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Dan. Thank you for doing this. And I will see you in a little bit. No worries. Happy to help. So I have the great distinction of uh, introducing Mary Murphy, a prize winning filmmaker extraordinaire. She's done everything from the best of network news and the best of network entertainment television. She's probably our nation's leading expert in all things Harper Lee, having created not one but two amazing films about Harper Lee and her work. Uh, it makes sense that she's such a wonderful storyteller, she would be drawn to Laura Ingalls Wilder, another remarkable storyteller. So welcome, Mary. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, <laughs> in the interest of full disclosure, a dear friend of mine whose work I completely adore. So. And the feeling is very mutual, so. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've established our love fest, um, I am wondering, what made you decide to make this film? Well, um, I they asked me, so that's a very different situation than the way I did Harper Lee. That was just a massive love project, and I kept and, and I just had to keep knowing more. American Masters, on the strength of the Harper Lee stuff, came to me and said, "We want to write an NEH grant for this. Would you write the NEH grant, and then you can direct the film?" And I thought, "Sure, great. Why not?" It and um, but what was interesting to me about the entire process was completely different from Harper Lee. I wasn't drawn to the books as a child. I mean, I, and I didn't come to Laura Ingalls Wilder until I was about 12, which was actually too late. I mean, I, my aunt Marilyn from Scarsdale gave me uh, these happy golden years for, for Christmas when I was 12 years old, loved it. It was about teaching and courtship. But then I went back and started reading the other stuff, but I was 12 and I'm like, oh, sorry, these are chores. These are about chores. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, and I didn't read, I didn't learn to read on those books. I mean, many, many young girls have this experience, including my sister, Martha Murphy, who can't believe I got to do this movie. And she didn't because this is exact. She grew each year. She was five. She was six, she was seven, when Laura grew, Martha grew, that's how a lot of people read those books. So I, you know, I considered this a huge challenge. And then as I began to read the books, sometimes for the first time, although Plum Creek was a favorite, even when I was younger, I began to think what's really, I'm glad I'm telling her life story because her life is incredible. Like set apart the books for a second, like. Her life's incredible and what she overcame and the fact that she turned herself into a best-selling children's author. I mean, I, you know, books are no, no. I was like, I'm in. Laura's, you know, and of course I had to do this during COVID. Mm -hmm. So it was a total test of my pioneer spirit. And, and I kept saying, if Laura can get, you know, and, and you know, <laughs> she's, a, she's a great example to me of someone who had a horrible life who made something like incredible out of it. So. So you've tapped on so many of the questions that I have for you. Um, I, I, I love the fact that you didn't know anything sort of about her really the way you did know about Harper Lee. I shared that experience coming to this film. I was never a little house girl, but my daughter was. So uh -huh. I was a little familiar. I cannot believe how much more interesting she is, and it, the film does a wonderful job of bringing home not just the value and importance of the books 
and what they teach us historically and about all different kinds of things in pioneer life. But the gap, the film tells us about the gap between the reality of her life and what's in the books. And I'm fascinated by that because I think people always thought the books were autobiographical. And in fact, they're not. And in fact, double in fact, <laughs> she insisted everything in the books was true. So can you speak to some of that? Yeah, I mean that was the fa that was very fascinating for me too, and and you know there's a lot of myth about this, and all I mean I learned this with Harper Lee, all lovers of books and you know devoted readers really do want to know what's real, what really happened, what but but w with these books the assumption always was that it all happened and this was her true life, true story, and while some of it's true-ish. A lot, I mean, there were some very dark chapters in her life that are not there. And I, and I remember really early on in my research, I met a woman who was an NYU sociologist teacher and she was reading them to her children. She's like, oh my God, Pa's crazy. I had no idea. And I mean, and when, you do, when you do sort of look at it, he kept driving them in. I mean, the Pa of the books is the guy with the wandering foot and the fiddle and the stories and all of that. I'm sure was absolutely true and Laura's love for, but he kept taking them farther and farther and farther into deepening poverty. I mean, until they got all the way to dismet. So, I, you know, I began to kind of explore that aspect of it. And then again, you know, you have to give any writer of any book, especially children's books, their due. I mean, you don't, you're not gonna put in a children's book that she was nearly raped in a hotel in Iowa, that's not for your audience, you know? So yeah. everybody's allowed to take, any writer is of course allowed to take what they want and do what they want with it. But there, are, and then there are some, I think obvious things she left out because of her audience. When you think about her as a human, you know, and uh, creating this incredible volume of work at a later age. I mean, she didn't do this until 65. She was yeah. Amazing. Talk about reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, and having a career late in life. And it was really sort of her daughter, I think, that propelled her forward. Her daughter's role in all of this is huge. Yeah, it's, um, and well, and also she, you know, she didn't just jump off her rocking chair on her porch and become <laughs> a best-selling author. I mean, she was a newspaper person. You know, right. she was writing a column about chicken farming and other things for the Missouri Ruralist. And like a lot of great American novelists of the time, you know, Twain, D Dreiser, Hemingway, they were all newspaper people. So she did, I mean, she didn't toil the way they did at, but but she did have a writing career before this. Her daughter, Rose, fascinating creature. Um, she ran off to see the world. She rejected farm life, and it's kind of amazing they both lived at the same time because Rose was very very modern, and and Laura was, you know, didn't wasn't. And Rose goes off to San Francisco, writes for these yellow Hearst newspapers, gets, you know, is very dramatic with her prose. And basically when her mother comes out to see her in 1915 to, to go to the World's Fair, part of their plan is to try to make Laura a more commercial writer because, you know, they were always scrambling for money. She and her husband, Almanzo, they did, they had their own farm. They did three and four jobs at a time to kind of keep everything going so financial was a big motive here and, and then Rose, and, i'm sorry wasn't rose, and rose was making a lot of money by the way she right. was a successful yeah. writer in her own right oh yeah and oh, yeah and she also became her mother's editor yes it was a real collaboration and um and 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 before covid i when i began to read the letters back and forth between the two of them before covid shut us down i had this dream that we were going to do a reading, you know, a night, a reading with fiddle and all the actors playing the parts in a place like the Bedford Playhouse or the Jacob Burns or, you know, that, that it would be this. And I had everybody lined up and, you know, COVID shut us down. But I, I was glad that we were in, even in COVID, that we did what we did because seeing two women read those letters back and forth really brings the relationship to life. And Rose has been you know, a lot of people have cast a lot, said a lot of sort of stuff about Rose's involvement. I mean, 
her tone to her mother is sometimes hard to listen to. But as I say, any any mother who's had their daughter roll their eyes at them knows what this is about. I mean, but it's a great act of love, I think, between the two of them. You know, they collaborated. They produced this best-selling eight, you know, eight volume series. Why was their collaboration a secret? I think they both want, I think, I think for Rose, Rose was in the big, big deal world. Like children's books then, there was no Harry Potter or, you know, I mean, that children, adolescent literature wasn't, being an, a children's book author, unless you were, I don't know who you had to be from that time, but it wasn't as desirable as what Rose was doing. Rose was writing big deal biographies. She was a magazine writer and Saturday. She didn't want, she didn't really want to be associated with what her mother was up to. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, it was, I don't know why they felt they had to do this because the record was all there for the taking once, once everybody was gone. But, you know, I mean, they wanted to sell books, I'm sure. And so, right. you know, why not leave well enough alone? Right. So I think you, you say in the film or the point comes across that writing was Laura's way of processing her life, including disaster and starvation and ruin. What sort of catharsis do you think writing offered her? You know, she, Laura herself, I, I don't know if it was a catharsis for, for starters. I mean, I, I think it was a way to memorialize her parents who were very, very important to her. Mm. And, you know, in those days, you leave home and you move to the middle of Missouri, you don't really see your parents ever again, you know, because yeah. it's just too hard to travel and life is yeah. the way it is. So I think, I think when her parents died, she began to gravitate in this way she's a very hard I, I found her maddening actually in a lot of ways because unlike Harper Lee where there's enough although she didn't give a lot of interviews there's stuff you can draw and I found real friends of hers who spent time with her and Laura's a, Laura didn't keep a very a personal diary and you have to kind of read between the lines with her anyway but I think it was I think it was very important to her to memorialize her her parents and i don't know if it was an unburdening that you know i mean like as i think about catharsis you know but but i you know she would and also she had tremendous work ethic yeah so you know once she started something she just kept at it there's a quote from somebody in the film that half of the quote is that that memories is memories are perhaps the consuming fires of torment Wow. That was Caroline Frazier who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning biography of, of her. But that was a quote from Laura Ingalls Wilder. From Laura Ingalls Wilder, exactly. Which she wrote the day um and she was shortly after her. her mother died. And right. you know, Caroline Frazier says it was a way of, you know, reckoning with both the good and the bad that had happened to her. And there was quite a lot of horrifying stuff that happened right, right. That, that along the way. Yeah. So the books were um, massive bestsellers. Not right away. Okay. Right, out of the gate, you know, they did pretty well. The Little House in the Big Woods did pretty well. It was the Depression. Right. But, but, but they had just tremendous staying power. And then I have to say, Rose, early marketing genius, it was her idea to package them in a little okay. box all together and to begin to promote them as a series, which had not really happened that much. Mm -hmm. And are they still popular today? I don't think they're nearly as popular as they were, say, when we were girls. Uh, I could not, my, I have a daughter who was not a bit interested. I think a lot of their popularity, which is not to say there's not a big audience for them right now. If you go to any of these Laura Palooza events at any of the home <laughs> sites, you'll see all these people who are completely drawn to finding out more. So there's still a huge reservoir of interest and people reading, but I think what's happened since is they used to be taught in schools and they used right. to be part of the curriculum. A way to learn to re read and a way to learn about pioneer history. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, all of that is gone by the wayside no, it is. Um, yes. for, for, well, for obvious reasons, because yes. the history of the West is completely different 
than right. how it was told when she first told it. And, you know, there's much more diversity about what kids are reading in school and they're learning differently now too, so. What do you think the material in the books, uh, what is most sustaining? What do you think carries through still today? I think, I mean, I think it's the uh, storytelling. I mean, I think it's Pa and the storytelling. I mean, I, and the happy family, you know, everybody wants a happy family. And um, in fact, Rich White, who was my DP on this, we were, but we both had this uh, argument. He used to come home after school and watch Little House on the Prairie. And I said, no, I was much more of a Walton's girl, but it's the same idea, which yeah. is the happy family at the end of the day, no matter how horrendous, no matter how hard life has been, it's cozy, you're all together. And you know, it's, 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 her, it's her story to tell and it's about loving your family, I think. I mean. How would you describe her relationship with her own father? I think she was a classic, it was one of those classic tomboy, you know, the, mm -hmm. Pa had no sons and she was the daughter who liked to do the stuff that Pa did, you know, and she, and, and I, and I think it was just kind of a classic father, daughter, you know, tomboy, daughter, the tomboy daughter and the father who are intensely close. So. So somebody else describes the material in the book as being lasting, sustaining because it's emotional comfort food. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, well, it's, that's sort of what I said too, which is it's cozy, it's happy, it's about love and um, right. I thought that was a very good description. Me too. Worth, yeah. Worth yeah. bringing up. Um, and the food, you know, the food in it is amazing too. And in fact, I, I, if she hadn't been so infirm, Barbara Walker, who wrote the Little House cookbook and cooked yeah. all the, you know, crow pies and did everything. <laughs> Basically, when I talked to her, she's about 93. But she said to me, you know why food was so important? They were starving, you know, yeah, so. Of course. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. That makes and you can see, sense. and you can completely see the difference in Farmer Boy because Almanza was raised in better, better uh, economic circumstances, and the food was more plentiful and better. You know. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You know, we talk about emotional comfort food and the Waltons versus Little House, and when yeah. you think about it, I can't think of another series of books that have been turned into a television series, right? that were based on you know children's stories this way that had such universal appeal so there's got to be some special sauce in there there's something really rich i think you know yeah. she had something very different than anybody else had because nobody else's series you know dr doolittle was never a television series right and, Mary right. Poppins, and yet there were a hundred you know there were those were series books too at the same time actually pretty right. much in the 30s so she did have a way of touching people that no one else had. Right. And I don't know if you can speak to that or define it. It's hard, it's hard. I think, again, it's kind of what we've already been mm -hmm. talking about, you know, Pa and the Pa of the TV show is different from the Pa of the books. And the TV show, as Melissa Gilbert will joke eventually, is it, it kind of got a little soap opera as, time went on because they because they didn't completely hew to the books but I think it is these um strong family relationships and the uh overcoming a kind of hardship that I can't imagine any modern person can even understand you know to live with you're 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 going to bed when the when it gets dark you're mm -hmm. listening to the panthers and the bears outside you're you know you're you're wondering when pa's going to make it home in the snow i mean there's and i think a lot of that stuff really really uh it just really appeals and and it's a kind of stoicism and moralism um that, that people want to hold on to do you think that there's a yearning today for material that offers emotional comfort food? Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, COVID, hello. I mean, I, I also think um, there's a, especially in COVID and she, and Laura came back big time in COVID. There were a lot of Little mm -hmm. House of the Prairie references and, mm -hmm. and people kept saying, this is like the long winter. And I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I think, 
I think when people are going through things, and this is why, you know, Helen Keller's essay about what she most wanted to see, you know, when it hit during the depression, and then these books during the depression, I think, you know, when times are really, really awful, finding out the people that came before you withstood something potentially much worse. Yes. And we're still standing and still here to tell you about all the important bonds and ties and things that happen. I, I mean, I think that really means something to people when they're facing their own adversity. Okay, so I think we're at time. I want to add oh, what's, okay. next, what's next for uh, oh, my filmmaking um, friend. I'm working on, uh, uh, I'm working for NBC. I, do, I worked on their uh, COVID anniversary special. I'm doing something, I think, about bringing Broadway back, which is going to be really hard but good to do and um and i'm helping american masters out uh, they've got this really great helen keller film that they're having to get to the finish line very quickly it's really rich and i'm just helping a little so that's great. enough of a plate for the moment yeah that's fabulous okay well thank you so, oh, so that much. went so fast All right we're, we're, we're pretty good to go here i think okay.